Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of The Great and Learning from Inferential Art to Aesthetic Inferentialism. Uh, I will start this seminar by providing a description of the seminar in the, in the bio of our instructor, JP Karen. Uh, the critique of indeterminacy in aesthetics has been on the rise for some time in your rationalist adjacent circles. Its targets are well known from John Cage to relational aesthetics, the supposition of either a noisy or unbounded indeterminacy, or of an unconstrained openness of the work to its signifying outside would grant political valence to contemporary works of art independently of any determinate demand or concrete formal unfolding. But what if indeterminacy is not so much an endpoint as a local suspension of constraints that could enable the reconstitution of the wiring diagrams that constitute aesthetic practices themselves. Richard Costolanetz offers in a short essay, Inferential Art, an interpretation of John Cage's seminal piece as triggering off the proper localization of the work through the process of its inferring from the sensible input. Once she, the listener, grasps the implication of 430, she can infer that literally everything she hears within that frame belongs to the piece. Henry Flint offers the concept of constitutive, constitutive disassociations as a means of understanding such aesthetic devices. The changing of the aims of a practice without declaring the change, the fashioning of a contrived enigma. This seminar will work with ideas that while well enabling the cult of indeterminacy might also be used as a lever to reroute the inferential pathways that constitute aesthetic practices. The local suspension of preconceptions regarding the structural constraints can be thought of as an enabling condition of the dissolution of practical givens. Inferentialism here as a term stemming from the philosophy of language of Sellers, Brandom and others is an index of the connections to be remade between intuitive content to be restructured and practical commitments to be revised. It is also indicative of a form of aesthetic rationalism that is not oblivious to the pragmatic constraints and procedural requirements of both political and aesthetic action. This amounts ultimately to a practical examination of the conditions of rational freedom consistent with Reza Negadistani's dictum, in a strict sense, freedom is not liberation from slavery. It is a continuous unlearning of slavery. Jean-Pierre Caron is a philosopher and artist based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. His doctoral research developed at both the University of Paris 8 Vicente Saint Denis and the University of Sao Paulo, proposed a critique of the aesthetic philosophy of John Cage in the context of contemporary ontology of art and philosophy of language. He's a lecturer in philosophy at the UFRJ, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and he militates in the circle of studies of the idea and ideology, CSII, an international political collective dedicated to examining the viability of the communist hypothesis today. He's been practicing noise and experimental music for more than 15 years, and several of his records have been released, many through his own imprint, seminal records. Recently, he's been working on the problem of generic organization as it appears in different fields like art, science, and politics, and its relationship to scale sensitivity. Uh, my name is Guilherme Coelho, and I'll be moderating the seminar. If you have any questions, you can contact me on the chat. And now I will pass the microphone to our instructor, JP Karen. Thank you, Guilherme. Yeah, that, that, uh, that bio is a little bit outdated because, you know, the CSII is does not exist anymore, so I should definitely uh, update it. Yeah, yeah. We, we are now the subset of theoretical practice. We are not the circle of studies of the idea and ideology anymore. Um, yeah, just, just, just a, uh, actually it's a reminder for myself I had to update the, the bio. Yeah, uh, I was intending to uh, read also the description of the course because it's pretty loaded, uh, but Guilherme already did it. Uh, but I think it's good to clarify a little bit certain, certain things about it. 
Should we do presentations first, Guilherme, like we use, usually do? Like we have like 20, 20 well, 24 without Zenobio and, and you that yeah. have to present. Yeah, should we do? Okay. Yeah, everyone uh, so can yeah, introduce so, themselves just so that we have a brief idea of everyone. Yep. Okay, so we'll do that and then I'll, I'll jump into the presentation. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm seeing Lika here first in the, in the, arrangement of windows. So uh, Lika, can you present yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Lika Ka uh, Karevan. I'm from Moscow. I do philosophy. I have a blog called Minecraft Philosophy. And uh, theoretically, I'm broadly interested in aesthetics and Kantian aesthetic judgments. Uh, and its uh, interpretations, but uh, today, today I was thinking about um, about the process of uh, attributing the chapters of philosophical book corresponding colors, and whether it is over conceptual to or it's non conceptual. Um, that is to say, unconscious. That's all. Okay, that's good. Then are you really sorry? I thought you were here just to you know uh, representing the institution, so you can you can present as well. You mean now? Yeah, you're okay. you're first actually. You're 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 first than Lika, so I, I thought you were like the new center. You, you see. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm also doing the, the, the same. So I'm a designer and researcher based in Brazil, and I'm I have a, a mixed background in in chemical engineering, physics, but I turned to to study design. Let me just silent that because it's annoying. And um, I'm I'm mostly interested on the new rationalist uh, concepts and to import them to design methodology. So I'm, I'm in this kind of, kind of a, a transdisciplinary field, but I'm also interested on the, how, how new rationalists could uh, see from the, the, the philosophical point of view, uh, aesthetics, and I guess this could also contribute to, to the design methodology that I'm thinking about. So, so yeah, that's mostly it. Thank you, Zenobio. Igor, you're, you're next here, at least from my point of view. Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is Igor Anabio. I am based in Brazil right now. And um, I'm, I'm finished my licentiate degree in visual arts and I'm, I'm very interested uh, for, my, for my thesis. I am writing about art and the internet and how the concept of internet art since its beginning points to a, a more uh, expanded uh, way of thinking these artist practices. So terms like uh, post-internet art, expanded internet art, uh, seems a, more, more, a little more redundant than the, because the term internet art since its beginning points to that kind of practice is an open one. But I'm also very interested in this in this kind of art that that is how how could I say uh, antagonistic a uh, kind of political art uh, that that uh, is, is start to be made in the in the sixties like uh, I, I I I don't know how how to put it but I'm uh, seeing uh, like site specific uh, art practice uh, art practices uh, very very. Put forward by by theoretical practices, but also this kind of criticism, uh, art oriented practices, political art practices, and engaged art practices. So uh, I think it is. This is. Thank you, Hugo. Maria, you're next. Hi. Uh, since the last time I presented myself, I changed the artistic collective, but I still am editor of texts about visual aesthetics, and I'm about to finish this seminar, uh, the race one, and restart my diploma about uh, the whole complex of Abby Warburg's problems and uh, whether images mean they just have a syntax, uh, what they are. 
this why I'm here. Okay, thank you, Maria. Great. Nicholas, you're next here, at least from my own point of view. Hi, um, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a producer, a performance a poet, artist. Um, I'm not really based anywhere uh, since the pandemic started. <laughs> um, was so I guess it's kind of between Mexico, Rome, and Zurich, um, and New York. Uh, but I work um, kind of from project to project, and I work with a lot of uh, different artists, and I'm in transdisciplinary now. Um, my own work kind of concerns itself with language and ecology and a lot of video games. So. Okay, great, thank you. Will, you're next. Hey, um, I'm Will, I'm based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I guess I'm a musician primarily, but um, I've now started the certificate program at the New Center because I've been studying philosophy independently for a few years now. And yeah, I'm extremely interested in this course because of, um, well, for sort of the register that that opening reading, the zero books, two chapters of just art being at a dead end and not asking the question of what art could be for. Um, I'm really interested in that sort of direction. Um, and also, I'm interested in this sort of great unlearning idea as it re relates to tonality in music too. And I'm kind of excited to hopefully take some of these ideas from this course and apply it to a lot of my kind of structural thinking about uh, tonal systems in music, so. Great, uh, are you engaged in uh, uh, just intonation, this kind of thing? No, not just, just uh, like tonality, more. no, not yet. <laughs> no, yeah, not so much. I'm, I'm just more interested in the kind of turn into serialism and... Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, Rodolfo, you're next. Rodolfo Ortega. Hi, I am uh, Rodolfo Stosa. Uh, I, I am Mexican and I live in Mexico. Uh, so I'm a visual artist and I work with how uh, the erosion of degradation of images caused, uh, are caused by translation and kind of things, uh, or over codification when they change or when they circulate. So that's my main, uh, um, my main point of studies or my main point of practice. Uh, that's all, yeah. Thank you. Nima? Hi, uh, my name is Nima. I'm from Iran, live in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, so I'm a, an artist dealing with the video installation. And my research is focused on uh, finding repressed element as a zero point for creative practice and creating new world and using desert as a platform for searching for the repressed element. Uh, I'm so happy that I'm here. Thank you. Kasia? Um, hi, I'm Cassia. I'm a noise musician and philosophy student. And I'm currently researching on the concepts of artificial general intelligence and forms of life. Oh, that was quick, Cassia. Okay. <laughs> Catherine? Hi, you? Catherine. Um, I'm a curator and researcher based in New York. Um, I also have a background in philosophy and um, tried to keep up doing, you know, various theoretical work in aesthetics and art theory. Um, and I work a lot with performance practices and so-called, you know, time-based art. So um, this question of sort of indeterminacy often comes up and um, it's very much at the heart of my current research. So, yeah. okay, Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Panos Urtolakis. Are you there? Yes, hi. Uh, sorry. sorry, I haven't. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm a curator. I'm based in Athens. Um, my work tends to, to be site responsive and engage with ideas around curating contexts and the presence of the viewer within them. And, um, my, and I also tend to explore the affective and contingent possibilities of time-based media. 
So yeah, and I'm happy to start this course. Thank you. Caroline? Or Caroline, I'm not sure where, where my you are, so yeah. Yeah, um, my name is, well, in English pronounced Caroline. I'm from Denmark. Caroline, okay. <laughs> Berlin-based writer, editor, and visual researcher. Um, very interested oh. also in the different possibility and limitations of different kinds of mediums knowledge production and how they may intersect and interact. And I'm also in the transdisciplinary program at the New Center. Thank you. Agatha? Hi, I'm Agatha. I'm a visual artist based in Poland. I mostly do painting, but I also do some <clears throat> teaching and I even started a curatorial project that the exhibition will be open this month uh, where I work with pharmacists and artists. So there was also a bit of kind of social work. Yes, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Vincent? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vincent. I'm a writer and researcher living in Manila. Um, I'm currently in the process of multiplying the vectors of my ongoing practice. And so I'm working on an array of sculptures, drawings, and lens-based work. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Mr. Slav? Uh, greetings. I am Sislav. Uh, I'm PhD in philosophy. I work as a lecturer in Kiev Polytechnic University. And I also have a couple of uh, conceptual uh, um, musical or post-musical projects. Uh, one of them is noise project. And I have already written about 80 pages concerning uh, noise um, and philosophy and their intersection. Uh, since one of my projects was directly inspired by uh, so-called uh, speculative re realism and so on. So I hope that this uh, seminar uh, will help me to finish up those 80 pages. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Lot. Malaki or Malachi? Malachi. Not sure. Uh, Malachi. Uh, Malachi. I, I would call myself a composer, I guess. I'm I'm here mostly for Cardu. I, I love the um I'm just really interested in the subject matter with relation to my own work and those who I love. Okay, thank you. Ikaro. Ikaro. Yeah. Ikaro go <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I am a philosopher and a film editor based in Brazil. Uh, currently I'm researching mainly the problem of uh, compatibilism between the determinism and uh, political agency and free will as well. Um, also in the Spinozistic uh, Resonance and Mac Fisher works, so I guess it's that. Thank you, Ikaru. Akshat? Hello, um, am I audible? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I'm um, right. So um, I'm Akshat. I'm uh, a novelist and a poet. I'm from New Delhi. Um, I'm really interested in, like, I enjoy listening to noise music, like, specifically Japan noise like Hanukkah and all of that. And uh, one of the things that like as a poet I've been interested in is how uh, music translates to poetry. So like we have uh, a generation of jazz musicians, we have a generation that was inspired by Stravinsky. So uh, a part of me, because like I'm uh, working right now, I always think about how um, things like lo-fi or vaporwave or uh, noise music would translate to poetry. So that is um, one of my interests. Thank you, Acha. Jeff, please. Hey there, my name is uh, Jeff Perrot. I'm based near Boston, Massachusetts. I'm an artist and I've done some work at the New Center in Critical Philosophy and Curatorial Studies. Um, I'm interested in that my, my work as a painter uh, employs um, stochastic processes and so I'm interested in my, the, the question I'm bringing to the seminar is really uh, whether or not these processes can uh, enter the space of reasons uh, rather yeah. than and be explicative rather than um, just be sort of um, generalized kind of um, philosophical statements about art. So I'll leave it there. 
Thank you, Jeff. At the fair. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Azafer. Uh, you can call me RT. I'm from Iran. I'm currently in Spain. I'm a master's student in gender studies. And in New Center, I'm a student in art and curatorial practice. And uh, my background is in theater studies. And, and also, I have been a translator. And now I'm mostly interested in like thinking about art generally as a way of thought or thinking and also like the potential it has for a subversion and intervention into so-called culture and uh, I'm really interested in this course because I have kind of generally an interest in a so-called conceptual art and I think it's interesting to see how we can reclaim or redefine certain uh, practices that has been around like uh, in the 60s, 70s, and so on. And so I'm, I'm mostly illiterate in sound arts, but I'm a real big enthusiast. Thank you. Thank you, Atafa. Uh, Ikaru, uh, not the one that I represented, of course. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ikaru. I am from Brazil. I am starting a master's degree in philosophy. My background is mainly on classical aesthetics, like classical German aesthetics, uh, mainly Hegel. But I have a more recent and ever-growing interest in uh, with what may be called a pragmatic point of view upon artistic phenomena. I'm in the context of speculative aesthetics. <laughs> And I think it's, that is it. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Icaro. Arman had already sent his presentation to the chat. I am not having a video today. If it's okay, I introduce myself here in the chat. I'm a sci-fi writer based in Tehran. Reading feel like it's the great campaign enacted by Sonadian civilization. Happy to be here. It's a good presentation. Thank you, Arman. Uh, Eduardo. I think uh, you're the last. No. Hi, everyone. Um, can can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, my name is Eduardo. I'm based in Curitiba, Brazil. I'm an artist and researcher. And um, I've been studying some ideas of Abi Weiberg in the context of um, image production on the internet. Thank you, Eduardo. Paige. Your last. Hi, I'm Paige. I'm based in LA where this starts at 6 a.m. So my brain is still waking up a bit. Um, I'm an artist and I mostly work with installation, performance and music and exploring the ecological body and forms of world building and communication and ritual. I'm excited for the class. Thank you, Paige. Okay, I think that's that's everybody. Did I left out anybody? No, don't think so. Okay, so I'll just uh, start uh, screen sharing. Okay, this is the great learning from inferential art to aesthetic interventionism first session. Yeah, um, as I was saying before the before the presentations, um, I was going to read uh, anyway, the description for the seminar that Guilherme already gave us, because uh, I think there's a lot of mediations there that is, are important for us to grasp and keep in mind, right? I mean, uh, but uh, since Guilherme already, already gave us the, the description, I guess uh, I can just jump into the, so this 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 uh, um, slide that basically uh, proposes the basic basic three strands in contemporary thought that are informing this seminar and that are that are present in that that description, right? So first one would be a certain critique of indeterminacy in contemporary theory. Uh, I'm, I'm exemplifying that with uh, Sohail Malik 
and uh, Sheen and Murphy, which was a required reading for today, right? So uh, this has been going on for quite a while. I, I, my first intention was to critically examine Malik's work, uh, but uh, yeah, we don't really have like the, the, the his, his thought in written form, in final written form. Basic, uh, his basic argument is in the form of videos, four videos that are available on, on YouTube. So I thought that was much more, you know, informationally costly to, to approach uh, directly through Malik's uh, thesis. There are a couple of texts. We are, we are reading one of them in the fourth session, um, but they are not as uh, complete as those videos are. Yeah. But this is, uh, and this is also an interesting thing that is enmeshed with the origins of the new center, from what I understand. When I was presenting the project of this uh, seminar uh, in the, the video, uh, I don't know, the video presentation that we did with all the instructors, right? Um, Mo was saying that from the inception of the new center, there was this kind of um, uh, relationship to this these, these, these people that are, are, are building from, from then on this critique of indeterminacy, which is the critique of the ready-made, also a critique of, you know, uh, what uh, Malik is calling the a meta, meta genre with no definition, which would be contemporary art that is trying to reflect upon a certain contemporary condition that is deemed indeterminate, therefore, the, the kind of work that is done is indeterminate regarding its genre. It's uh, maybe it's even not, it's ontological, uh, it's ontological uh, classification in a certain sense. So this 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 actually was also um, suggested to me that this was a relevant issue uh, during the first seminar that I ever gave in the New Center, which was uh, actually about the ontology of art, and it was already related to post Cajun aesthetics. Uh, somebody's uh, one, one student asked me what I what I thought of the current uh, critique of indeterminacy regarding the fact that I was uh, basically working within the post-Cajun uh, statics uh, uh, milieu. Uh, so I didn't have a really an answer at the time, but this is this is a kind of uh, something that since then was interesting to me because basically my interpretation of post-Cajun aesthetics is quite different from usually we take post-Cajun aesthetics to be like. Okay? So in a certain sense, I think that I can um, defend post-Cajun aesthetics from the critique of indeterminacy in a certain sense. So then the second axis is post-Cajun aesthetics, right? So the, basically we'll be looking not only at the work of uh, John Cage and his ideas, but also some of uh, the people that were influenced, that were associated with this, with this uh, artistic arc. Uh, for instance, Cornelius Cardio and uh, Henry Flint would be maybe the two most important ones to be uh, discussed in this seminar. Um, and they are also discussed in my, my own uh, my own uh, theoretical work on these issues. So they are part and parcel of this uh, attempt to, you know, uh, theorize a certain image, a certain idea of post cajun aesthetics that is not uh, closed off within what John Cage usually talked about his own work. Uh, so this is, this is also part of the, of the problem. And the third uh, axis, which I, I haven't mentioned so far is influential philosophy of language, basically because you know, as some some people here know already, uh, it's a kind of uh, understanding of the functioning of language that gives pride to uh, the pragmatics uh, and to uh, inference as a first explainer like a priority, having the pre explanatory priority, right? In the understanding of language uh, against the, you know, more traditional understanding uh, that is a representationalist order of explanation that tries to build up language out of 
sort of sheer reference to, I don't know, the uh, objects that uh, are named in the language. So uh, inferential, inferentialist philosophy of language is a good platform, a good infrastructural platform for understanding action and understanding also certain uh, uh, meaning conferring activities and some and the background that inform these meaning conferring activities. So uh, in this, basically in this work on post cajun aesthetics, I'm trying to understand uh, this kind of aesthetic practice as a kind of uh, doing that is describable in inferentialist term, terms, but not only they are, it's a practice that is describable in inferentialist terms, but it is a practice that also makes explicit the inferential purpose of artistic practice. This would be a, one of my strong arguments in usually what I think about these issues, okay? So uh, these would be like the three basic uh, axes, right? And they, these don't immediately form a coherent whole, they form an argument to be unfolded in the same way. So of course, when you see it like that, like critique of indeterminacy in post cajun aesthetics, perhaps they are uh, more, you know, uh, intimately uh, related immediately. So while uh, inferentialist philosophy of language seems like something that is brought from, imported from outside, as we can say. But you'll see that this is something that is weaved into this fabric uh, that I'm trying to present. Okay, so this would be like a certain way to understand this description. Like it, it starts from the critique of indeterminacy in aesthetics, uh, goes to you know offer a certain view of, uh, for instance, John Cage's uh, four minutes thirty three seconds as inferential art, which is kind of a gem, like a really short text that I proposed to you. For today, Richard Costellanitz's uh, inferential art. Of course, Richard Costellanitz wasn't uh, informed by inferentialist philosophy when he wrote that, but it's kind of an interesting passage between these uh, intellectual uh, uh, sceneries. Uh, and goes on to, you know, um, talk about, you know, the uh, constitution and dissociation, dissolution of. Uh, wiring diagrams that you can uh, locate and describe through the inferences they are participating, we are participating in, right? So, and this uh, also would, uh, within this uh, framework, we shall be using also uh, discussing and using Harry Flint's idea of uh, constitutive dissociation. Everything that I use here is, is a kind of partly against their own proponents, right? post cajun aesthetics view that I've proposed here is kind of partly against Cage, and the use of constitutive dissociations that are that is proposed here is partly against Flint's own understanding of what he's trying to do. So yeah, this is a very dialectical, polemical kind of uh, engagement with these these issues. So uh, also I have to comment upon uh, the title, like with unlearning, which is a reference. Or this, uh, to the seminal work by Cornelius Cardio, The Great Learning, which is a set of sometimes simpler, sometimes more complex instructions for performance, including text, graphic scores, musical notation, which offers indeterminate and or improvisatory results. So uh, actually, The Great Learning is almost like a kind of a platform for testing inferences and the actions that result from these inferences that are being proposed in the text and, and through the graphic scores and musical notation and everything else. Unfortunately, uh, I can't really uh, show copyrighted material in these presentations because, uh, you know, because of YouTube. Uh, so uh, we'll have just to talk about them and I'll add some stuff with uh, in the folder that you have access to. So we may continue these conversations in a more uh, specific uh, way uh, after each session during the week and in the classroom or in the Discord. Uh, uh, in the Discord. No. So, uh, the Great Learning takes its title in sung text from the Ezra Pound translation of the Confucian text, which consists of seven paragraphs that offer guidance in the organization of society and the achievement of self control. Of course, 
the Confucian text is usually thought of as a kind of reactionary kind of uh, politics, right? So Cardio eventually became a Maoist abandoning the project of elite learning, not without first trying to adapt it to his new political interests. By the end of the seminary, we hope it will be clear what kind of inspiration the example of Cardio gives us, which is also, I was already announcing it, right? Like this uh, kind of, what I usually, what I, what I also take from Flint, like this epistemological laboratory that Flint wants us to uh, engage in through the use of constitutive associations, like the great learning is almost like an ethical laboratory, right? The fact that you are now composing diagrams of action, not necessarily sounding results, right? Even though the sounding results are, are, uh, are uh, a way to inspect the actions that are brought about by the individuals engaged in this, these diagrams uh, is, a, is, is an interesting ethical result. It's an ethical uh, purport to this kind of art that we call like the event score in some circles. The fact that you are not anymore providing necessarily a finished uh, musical notation with the definite results, but you are kind of constructing the means by which a certain definite result may come about. So this is quite interesting to us and quite under thought, I'd say, in the you know, contemporary theory of music and art. And I, I think this is a quite under thought uh, path under, uh, that is uh, being presented here. Okay, so. Then I have uh, I have a I have a, like a written version of what I just said. Like the seminar is a four session course divided thematically. The first session is called indeterminacy and intends to offer a constellation of problems regarding the use and conception of indeterminacy in art, particularly through the examination of John Cage's work. At the same time, it offers a miniature version of the unfolding of the whole course, from the critique of indeterminacy going through it and not against post Cajun aesthetics into a picture of the role of determining inferences in art. Okay. So yeah, I won't say much more about it because then I'll, I'll lose, the, lose the objects for the next session. So second session is called inference. And it takes from where the first left by tackling in a detailed manner one possible inferential diagram of action that can be extracted from inferentialist philosophy of language. This will be dealt with mainly through an engagement with Wil Wilfred Sellers' seminal paper, some reflection on language games, and some results of that reading will be uh, applied to a paper by Cornelius Cardio on the role of instructions in the indeterminate music, which is quite, quite striking uh, piece of, uh, of thought, of musical thought and uh, philosophical thought. So third section is called dissociation and will be basically dedicated to the work of Henry Flint on constitutive dissociation. Here the seminar acquires a more polemical tone in the sense that while engaging with the work of Flint, it argues perhaps against Flint's own project for the inferential purport of CDs, constitutive dissociations, as a way to reset and rewire possible inferential diagrams. We shall also respond to a recently published critique by David Roden against what he called uh, aesthetic inferentialism. Basically, it was against my position and maybe Reza, he mentioned Reza, Reza Nagarstani and myself in the paper. So I'll take the opportunity to address uh, this uh, David Roden's critique. And this is not just an opportunity that I take to address it, but because uh, this kind of uh, critique uh, has some uh, elements in common with, uh, with, with Link's own understanding of what he's doing in a certain sense. So, it's kind of weird because I'm I'm the Flintian here, but uh, yeah, the, the paper that I wrote about Flint is somewhat uh, different from what Flint understands him to be doing. Right. So uh, what's interesting, what's what's kind of uh, 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 striking in this uh, the way this is unfolding is the fact that the uh, Rodin's critique, in a certain sense, tries to reverse to a more Flintian understanding of what, what, what Flint's doing, in a certain sense, against my reinterpretation in uh, the paper on constitutive associations that we, were, we will be reading in the third session. Okay, So in the fourth and final session, it's called rewiring, and discusses some parameters for a possible rewiring of the diagrams being dissociated 
in the more institutional sense. And then institution here will be something that can be derived and uh, understood through the engagement with this, you know, linguistic pragmatic uh, philosophy that is inferentialist philosophy of language. So, uh, and from there, you can also see something that may interest some people here. I see a lot of familiar faces and friends. Uh, there's some uh, relationship to uh, the previous seminars that I was teaching at the new center regarding world making and, you know, forms of life and all, all this institutional uh, fabric that makes up uh, certain diagrams of action that may be uh, objectified and described. Uh, so this is uh, continuous with that, uh, with that uh, line of research, even though, I mean, even more than continuous, it is actually in a chronological sense, this is previous to that line of research because this was actually the subject of my PhD, uh, which was actually something that uh, motivated the whole world making uh, forms of life, uh, life forming, as I was uh, proposing, uh, problematic. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so here we'll just jump into the the issues. Any any question up until now from regarding anything that I that I said? Uh, all the questions are welcome. Please. Okay. Yeah, Maria, go on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do have a question. What's your relation to the word world making becoming so fashionable that it's in every other text in uh, like in Flux and all the other media? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say, I would say that, that's, that's interesting. I would say this, like uh, I started studying, you know, Woodman uh, way before this fashionable wave like I was my my master's degree was in 12 years ago and, and it dealt with Goodman because you know it is Goodman is a kind of also again as I said like everything I use I use it against their own proponents so Goodman is kind of a good enemy Goodman is a great enemy uh, so world making is uh, something that I uh, agree with in a certain sense that I uphold to be true, the fact that we don't have unmediated access um, to reality. So any kind of access, knowledge at access that we would have, would have to build its own way to, you know, its own understanding through a certain uh, logical form and uh, background uh, meaning. Uh, that is uh, created within certain brackets. So this this bit of Goodman, that is the world making bit, I'm, I'm I'm on board with. I mean, broadly speaking, with a certain caveat and with a certain kind of understanding, as you all know, of course. Uh, but uh, I was engaging with Goodman already, like uh, in 2010, because if you are into the post Cajun aesthetics field, uh, Goodman is somebody that was proposing a theory of notation. I, I actually also talked about the theory of notation in previous seminars. Uh, theory of notation that basically skews any kind of indeterminacy. It was, it was, a, it is the extreme of determinate, uh, of determinate uh, results that uh, ought to be uh, uh, yielded by such a theory of notation because basically Goodman is answering to an ontological problem regarding, you know, the statue of uh, the statues of uh, musical works. So if he's not wanting to uphold the idea that musical work is like an abstract pattern of sounds, he will have to uphold a certain uh, a nominalistic reduction of that. And the nominalistic reduction of that is done through notation. So you have to have a notation that univocally determines a uh, sounding object, so to speak. So this is pretty much the anti-cage thing like the anti-cage, extreme, extremely anti-Cajun uh, idea. So Goodman was the, the, the extreme example that I wanted to criticize at the time, but I was also criticizing Cage. So anyway, this it, is kind of, kind of really, I think uh, this is trying to build a certain, a certain pathway between uh, 
be, uh, trying to navigate between these extremes and trying to uh, construct a certain viable uh, philosophy of uh, art practice and language and uh, weaves into philosophical language and philosophical of art practice in a certain sense. So I'm not sure I had anything to do with that. I'm just, just uh, elaborating on your question. Sorry, Maria, you, you know, uh, I, like, I like the question because I, it's given me, given me the opportunity to elaborate a little more on, this, on the issue. So every question is welcome. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I've seen that there was kind of a rave uh, about world making recently. This is why I, I take it that uh, David wanted to attack it in a certain sense. So we'll be addressing this in the third session. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> Please, any, any question is welcome. Even clarification questions, because this is very important to just have like this map, right? Uh, this little map in, in, our, in our minds as we proceed, okay? So then I'll, I'll, let me check the chat. Uh, good enemy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was kind of, this was a joke about me actually when I was a student that I, I always studied my enemies. So I was never write, writing something for anybody. It was always, people was, well, why are you studying like Goodman so much if you don't like him? I, at the time I was much more you know, adamant in my opposition. And I said, because, because he's a good enemy. And, and, and this was always the case. So anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, Rodolfo, go on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi. Uh, no, it's just uh, my first seminar with you, and I wanted to know a little bit more about the previous seminars or how they are entangled yeah. with this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I only, I, I can only do this very, you know, very broadly because they are, they were quite kind of, um, they were kind, quite a, a labyrinthine <laughs> seminars in a certain way. So. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, the interesting thing is that uh, I come from this uh, philosophy of music research first. I mean, chronologically, now I'm more into the philosophy of language and epistemology, this kind of different, different kind of, of uh, engagements in philosophy. Uh, but in the New Center, the fact is was that I, I started from you know, uh, when I started teaching at the New Center, I, well, I picked up from my PhD, first the first seminar was about uh, ontology of art, which is to me, it's something that I'm not as, as proud about now, but hey, it was okay, I suppose, as a first seminar. And uh, then there was like the Portuguese language one, and then there was, uh, which was a kind of a commission, People asked me to talk about, you know, the CCRU and its aftermath and uh, speculative realism for a Lusophone uh, audience. And then there was uh, the world making ones. The world making ones was were quite crowded in terms of uh, subject matter because the problem was that it, they were supposed to be one uh, two credit seminar and they became two one credit seminars. So you, you can't really slice up a seminar and like keep everything uh, apart. Like you have to weave into each, each, each half everything that you were going to treat in one, 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 one process only. So, uh, so they are both uh, seminars that were trying to uh, differentiate two notions, two philosophical notions that were important to me, that are important to me. One is this world-making thing that Maria was mentioning that became, you know, uh, like a catchphrase. Everybody likes it or hates it, either likes it or hates it now. Uh, there was this world, world making thing, and I was trying to understand the, the, the following thing like, if uh, every knowledge practice is a kind of a creation, like a world, we have to come up with a framework where things are uh, logically salient and they have kind of a certain. Um, uh, uh, specific relationship to one another, like, and, and Woodman is always 
giving examples of different kinds of worlds, so to speak, where um, uh, they make uh, internal, uh, they are internally coherent, but they don't cohere with each other. And we, they are useful, nevertheless, even they, if they are internally coherent and does, then do not cohere with each other. So this is this world pluralism, which is a, which is a weird kind of position. And uh, I was interested in that and the consequences of that and the idea that also you have kind of a, a pluralism of forms of life in the Wittgensteinian sense. Right? Uh, so forms of life would, would, would be kind of a certain uh, specific unfoldings that constitute a certain uh, a set of scenes as, I would say, a scene as is very different from a scene, right? A scene, you can understand scenes or listenings as uh, physiological processes, whereas seeing as or listening as, they are uh, classificatory processes. So. They are kind of, uh, they deal with uh, the relationship between sensible contents and conceptual contents. How do you understand that which is a sensible content to be like? What is it? You see? So this makes up worlds in a certain sense. So I was interested in, a, it was a basically an investigation about uh, the foundations of world making and whether you could uh, reverse uh, and, uh, and um, point and, 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 and world make your own form of life, so to speak. So this hypothesis of world making your form of life, I was, uh, I was calling life forming. So uh, this was basically the idea. And uh, yeah, and uh, this came about chronologically, as I, as I was mentioning, after the, my engagement with, uh, you know, uh, John Cage and post-Cage and aesthetics in a certain sense, because in order to understand the ontology of those art practices, you have to describe and understand the actions, the uh, uh, linguistically mediated actions that comprise those practices. So in a certain sense, I was already within a certain uh, way of understanding uh, practice that was enmeshed with language and with uh, world making, so to speak. So is that clear enough? Very cursorily, very broadly, but yeah. yeah there's a big bunch of other issues like uh, the engagement with Pachi Wu. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, the basic gist of it was that. Um, okay. Yeah. What's what's Armand said? I read random like that. It's hell. What 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 do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. This is kind of uh, non, non uh, without context. I don't understand what you mean. But anyway. Um, okay. I'll I'll just jump in. So uh, we'll we'll take it from the Shinnett Murphy text, which is kind of a contemporary commentary. Still contemporary commentary. It's been a while. Like the the books. Uh, five years old, something like that. But it is a, a contemporary commentary upon this uh, indeterminate or indeterminacy in art, right? So as I, as I mentioned, I thought that Suhail Malik was more direct, but I think there are many, uh, many points of uh, agreement between what Shinnett Murphy is saying and the critique that Suhail Malik is, is, is doing. And uh, what's interesting is that this, this critique of indeterminacy in art was kind of uh, in the case of Sohail Malik, also motivated by his uh, engagement with left accelerations. So in a certain sense, it had to do with this inferentialist or this uh, uh, neo-rationalist or uh, uh, the inception of this neo-rationalist uh, position, right? But anyway, just, just some context of, of his choice, okay? So uh, here, uh, Shinnett Murphy gives, uh, gives us a very interesting uh, example of an indiscernible, like an indiscernible, the problem of indiscernibles in the ontology of artworks is pretty well known. I will be discussing a little bit of that. So in June 2001, a man called Brian Hall began his own protest against another British government decision, the one to invade Iraq 
are produced and collected placards and other objects expressive of his and others' opposition to the invasion, displaying them neatly along one side of Parliament Square. Protest was well conceived, obtrusive but not offensively so, sustained, or lived with it for 24 hours a day, and of course, right on the pulse of political events and visible to thousands of Britons every day and to their Prime Minister Blair on many days. However, in April 2005, a new serious organized crime and police act was passed, which had the effect of outlawing unauthorized protests within one kilometer of Parliament Square. In May 2006, five years and 40 meters of Parliament Square after its beginning, house protest was almost entirely dismantled. But, and this is the really interesting bit, before it was dismantled, it was carefully photographed by the British artist Mark Wallinger, who then faithfully reconstructed it as a work of art. Its title was State Britain. It was on exhibition in Tate Britain from uh, January to August 2007. Why this is interesting is that Tate Britain is partly situated within one kilometer of Parliament Square. Wallinger used an arc of black tape to mark the intersection of State Britain with a newly designed exclusion zone. But Wallinger Wartwork, though indiscernible from Hall's protest, was not dismantled by the police. Hall's protest became become art, has ceased to make itself heard. So, uh, the example might look ineffective in the sense that a protest uh, has a different kind of functioning than a work of art. Difference that is indexed, for instance, by the very fact of the dislocation from a public square where administrative buildings are located to a semi-public space of an art gallery or museum. But to say this is to presuppose the reasons that make such a transformation to occur and to elide the opportunity to draw one conclusion or other regarding the political potencies or impotencies of art. So yeah, the year I'm already kind of, uh, one has to take this with a grain of salt. I think it's a quite striking image to have like an indiscernible, like the ones that, for instance, Arthur Danto was discussing. I'm not sure if everybody's uh, familiar with it, but I'll, I'll comment briefly on that. Uh, and uh, the use of indiscernibles in order to kind of track uh, properties that make the difference beyond the phenomenal properties of the indiscernibles, right? This is kind of the heuristic use of indiscernibles in uh, contemporary philosophy of art. And here's a kind of, this is a kind of interesting uh, example in the sense that uh, a certain replica is constructed of, uh, of a protest. And because the replica is, the replica is even within the, uh, uh, situated within the peri perimeter of, you know, that was uh, 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 prohibiting uh, political manifestations, but it was uh, tolerated. So what does that mean? I mean, uh, uh, Shannon Murphy, of course, who this is kind of uh, the inception of her idea of, you know, uh, art being a kind of control or being a kind of channelization of, uh, you know, dissent with, with uh, in order to, you know, in a, within a, a controlled sphere, you see. So this is the basic gist of the, of the, of the book in a certain sense. And, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, even if you don't agree with that conclusion, you see, uh, there is something to be gained by looking at this, at this, uh, uh, at this uh, gesture that has, has to do with the use of uh, uh, indiscernibles in order to uh, individuate properties. Like there is something, some property in Wallinger, something or more or something less, like in Wallinger's uh, uh, reconstruction that is absent from the original or that is, or something that is present in the original that is absent from Wallinger's reconstruction. So what is, the, what is it? So this is kind of uh, usually the form of the indiscernible, the argument from indiscernibles in the philosophy of art. And this is an interesting one because it is uh, basically, uh, it has to do with the political valence of, uh, and the kinds of political valence of what's being done. I mean, uh, as, I, as, I, as I was mentioning, maybe you could uh, disagree with uh, Shinad Murphy's uh, conclusions regarding this, mainly on grounds that, you know, art practice are not a direct protest. They may have political uh, 
consequence or political uh, uh, reflect on political issues without being, you know, something that functions as a protest. It functions otherwise. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, the point is that there is something about this political dissent being uh, manifested by the thought experiment of the um, indiscernibles here. Okay. So a second possible clear critical point about Murphy's use of this example, uh, this, was, uh, this, uh, this is what I was just saying, is that it exemplifies not so much an unwanted shift of emphasis from being a political protest to being a work of art, as it is an examination of this shift itself. But then Murphy has a further argument against this such examination. So one a very interesting uh, detail uh, that uh, I think Murphy kind of glosses over is the fact that Wallinger himself was using the black tape to, to show that his work was in the perimeter. So uh, it seems to be part of the work, not only the, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, social capital of, you know, uh, having a uh, political, uh, um, a, uh, so to speak, uh, parasitic, maybe, political uh, purport that is parasitic upon the work of Hall, Grand Hall, uh, but it is also reflecting on, on this shift itself. So, the shift is not an unwanted result, like the losing of the political valence might not be an unwanted result by Wallinger, but it might be basically the point of the work, like what is, what is uh, gained or lost with this, you know, dislocation. So, uh, but uh, Murphy, we even, even if the, the discussion is about this kind of dislocation, she has a further kind of uh, critique of this kind of uh, artistic practice. So I quote from her, we might begin to think that this mantling of possibilities for protest achieved by a government bent on protecting the freedom of its citizens and that its transportation from the political realm to the art museum merely enacts the extent to which the political commitment to freedom as a regulative ideal tends once it begins to operate at the level of form rather than content. There is something quite important here uh, to reduce political action to a mere performance of action, to remake it as an installation of merely aesthetic import and thereby to manage very well its scope and effects. So in a certain sense, even if uh, the point is to reflect on this shift from the political register to the artistic register, right? Uh, the problem is the shift itself uh, seems to uh, create a form of representation of a political dissent that because it is a representation, it has a certain form of aboutness to each the, to, to, to itself that it's not, uh, it's not the same as being the thing itself, the political dissent that is being represented, you see. So uh, the fact that you shift uh, the context makes, makes it a kind of simulacrum, would be the kind of uh, the interesting point made here. So this begins to touch upon the problem of becoming art of the non-artistic, which is a staple of contemporary state of art since Cage and Duchamp, while the rebranding of political manifestations as art may help the anarcho-realist credentials, as Suhail Malik would say. Suhail Malik talks about this anarcho-realist maxim, which is a kind of uh, injunction for art to uh, get out of the art institution of certain sense, to become more real, less artistic, less aesthetically, and matched statically uh, framed, right? Uh, but the point is that this anarcho-realist maxim became the, uh, the uh, mainstream of artistic practice in a certain sense. So uh, once it becomes a mainstream, like the, the artistic practice itself becomes to be defined by the anarcho-realist maxim. So uh, then this re-edition of the avant-gardist gesture of, you know, uh, getting, art, uh, getting art out of art into life becomes uh, 
the uh, completely the, the, the basic insignia of being art nowadays. So this would be kind of part of Sohail Malik's critique. So I'm making a really uh, uh, reference here to the idea of the anarcho-realist maxim. So uh, while the rebranding of political manifestations as art may help the anarcho-realist credentials of art, it nevertheless doesn't make the art thus produce more political in its effects. If you understand the political effects to be the dissent it provokes uh, and the fact that the political has a certain address, a certain specific address. In Brian Hall's case, the specific address was also was the, 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 the entrance of, uh, of Britain in the war in Iraq, right? There's a specific political address, whereas uh, the, the artistic simulacrum somehow may lose this political address and become uh, basically closed off within uh, its own um, uh, questioning of its own conditions as being either art or being either art or politics, see? So the argument would say that quite the opposite. It takes the political out of the political manifestation, turning it into a representation of political dissent. So this can mean either that uh, there is something lost here, like this kind of political art is not actually political, is a kind of assembling of social capital because it deals with political subjects without having political effects. Okay? Or this could mean simply that the art practice would have, can have still political effects, but they are not the political effects one may expect from a direct protest with a direct address. Okay. One, of course, one thesis is much stronger than the other. I think uh, Shined wants to defend the first one. I'm not sure if it's the right one though. Okay. Let me check the chat. Yeah, Maria seems to have lots to say about this. Do you want to comment upon that, Maria? <laughs> I think that yet, because I will take much time. But I wanted to say that all the involved in this text, both uh, Hall and Murphy, and even maybe Malik, uh, believe that anything in the museum is art, while uh, an art critic, anyone who works as such, knows that uh, this is far from true. If we take a Kazarian definition of art as uh, the highest uh, achievements of culture, uh, anything can belong to the museum, not be art at the same time. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I will address this in a minute. Just a second, okay. Uh, any more uh, observations or questions? Yeah, Lika. Uh, I'm uh, not sure I understand uh, the, uh, uh, the anarcho-realist uh, part <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the example, in the example State Britain, which we discussed, mm -hmm. uh, there was the situation. First, uh, there is uh, mm, an, a political action with a, a certain concrete uh, content in the real life and then it was transported into the form into the form of art where uh, there is only form that exists uh, and doesn't matter what the content is I so, would say it doesn't matter. The thing is the content gets shifted once you do that. Like this is kind of the idea. There is still content. There is a reference to, you know, because you are copying the, the whole manifestation, there is a kind of a reference to what was the reference of the manifestation. But it does not uh, register as a protest in a certain sense anymore. It, there is kind of a, the, the point here is that the fact that is when it becomes art, it, it, it gets neutralized, the political purport of this. Yet, yes, yes, yes. Partially, partially mm -hmm. neutralized, right? Mm -hmm. Just uh, in general, my uh, question is, uh, uh, we see in, in that example that uh, the movement is from life, <laughs> concrete, with, a, with some concreteness, to uh, an art form, which is very mm -hmm. determined. Yeah. Uh, but Malik 
as I understood it, says that uh, art has a tendency to go in the opposite direction. Yeah, the thing is, uh, Wallinger is an artist, right? And he's making what is a work of art. Of course, the example shows a shift from, uh, I don't know, a real occurrence to the museum. Let us, you know, only heuristically use this kind of dichotomy because of course, then one, one, one has to answer what is life? <laughs> what is the real world? So yeah, so then we are lost. We are, we are basically fucked. So <laughs> let us just use this uh, heuristically, like there is, I don't know, the, the museum or the, the, the realm of art making and it's outside. Let's say that in a certain sense that there's a systemic differentiation differentiation right so wallinger is an artist what if even if empirically what is being done is you know to copy something that is a real life occurrence into a, a work of art the fact is that he's doing it because the work of art should be reaching for the outside you are not anymore accepting you see or or you're not anymore uh, dealing with medium specificity so much, for instance, when you did paintings, when you did music, and these were kind of defined limits to a certain practice, you see, and they were artificially defined, you knew that a painting is not a real world occurrence or anything like that. You have a certain kind of uh, proximity through the, you know, since the ready-made and since John Cage, a certain kind of proximity between, you know, the art, or what, what is, happening within the realm of art and real real life occurrences of sort. And this is kind of sometimes, uh, not, not always, but sometimes, or, or mainly, maybe it's a dominant form of discourse. It's a discourse against a kind of representation of certain sense. Like it's, a, it's almost like you want to have the real occurrence as being art. And uh, the problem is that this, is ha this has a kind of historical art to it as well. Because if we go back to, for instance, the avant-garde in the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, if we believe, for instance, the reading of Peter Bürger, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Peter, the theory of the avant-garde by Peter Bürger, which is a kind of a, uh, one of my favorite books on the, on the issue. Uh, he says, for instance, that the, the point of the avant-garde was not so much to bring, you know, life events into art, well, it was to criticize and dismantle the art institution itself and to spread this kind of uh, creativity, supposed creativity of the artistic medium into life, in a certain sense. And for Bürger, this was, uh, this was uh, defeated. So what it uh, ended up creating was a non-organic, a non-organicist form of art that, you know, Adorno and others would, would, would come to, you know, appreciate and, and defend and, and all that. And Adorno, for instance, is quite different because he insists upon the autonomy of the artwork, which is quite different from, you know, the, um, the avant-garde gesture, avant-garde gesture of dissolving this autonomy into life in a certain sense. And you can see in this kind of uh, discourse very pervasively in the neo-avant-garde and in, in, in Cajun discourse. This is why I, I was presenting my own kind of uh, take on John Cage that we will start seeing here uh, in a minute, uh, I, I kind of against this idea that Cage is actually eliding the difference between art and life, because there is a functional difference between what, what appears as an artwork and what appears as not art, uh, as a non-artwork, as, as a, a real life occurrence. So the point is that uh, what, what happens is if you want to elide this difference and there's a systemic differentiation that uh, impedes this elision, you cannot really elide the difference. Uh, the artwork becomes a didactic thing. Like there is a didacticism that the artwork can still perform that would, um, that would educate the senses and you know your inferential pathways to appreciate that which is not art. And I, I'm, I'm being charitable here. I'm being charitable. I, I'm, I'm offering this as the most charitable way to save the anarcho-realist maxim. You cannot really align the difference while being art. Of course, it, otherwise you just you're not doing art anymore, which is okay. But then everything you do disappears, right? If you, I, I will give I, I, another interesting example. I have this good friend of mine who's a noise musician. 
uh, he made this, you know, very uh, doom, doomy and gloomy tape of noise. It has his picture in the cemetery, in the cover. And uh, he wanted to, and, and he, he, there, was a lot, there was a lot of, you know, weird kind of uh, procedures in the making of this tape, which is a, really a tape, like a, a cassette tape, you know, noise musicians like cassette tapes and stuff. So, and he, um, he um, buried the cassette tape. He wanted the cassette tape to be like the corpse that it is representing because it's his, it's a death industrial project. So it's has all this you know all this this imagery of corpses and all of that. So he wanted the cassette tape to be become a corpse in a certain sense. So he dug it up, and the sound was bad because it's like uh, he told me I'm not sure this is this is kind of uh, uh, artistic gossip that he was creating for himself. But he told me like, oh, uh, it, it, it spent too much time buried, so it's not good anymore. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to fix it for me. So I had to get the tape and digitalize and you know recreate the, the stuff that was missing from the spectre in order for us to, to release it. But then he 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 had this idea of releasing it in physical format. And I, I said, okay, we can do a bunch of tapes and sell them. It's fine. No, 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 no. I want to do a bunch of tapes, a bunch of, a bunch of copies, and leave the tapes there in, you know, bus stop in the streets and stuff like that. I was kind of, yeah, you know, uh, I understand where you're coming from. Like, you don't want no truck with no, you see, you see like art marketing or music marketing or this kind of thing. You want to really, you know, make your art be the thing that it is about. If you 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 are you have like a death industrial project, you want your, your tape to be like a, a, either a corpse or either a kind of a, 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 a contingent happening. Like somebody will find the tape in a bus stop and I don't know get uh, bring it to home and listen to it. So, but I but I, but I told him, you know, the chances for this for this for this happening are, are very slim. Like. <laughs> Who will pick up the tape and, and, and listen to it and understand it as being, you know, uh, being the thing that it is about, which is the perfect embodiment of the anarcho-realist maxim. In a certain sense, you want to do a certain form of aesthetic gesture that is symbolic in a certain sense, but at the same time, it's not caught within, you know, the framework of art making necessarily, that in a certain sense uh, deprives it of its, I don't know, authenticity or uh something like that so it, this is a perfect example of for instance there are certain constitutive dissociations let us call them right now because this is a constitutive dissociation you make a tape that is supposed to be marketed as music but you do not market it as music you just spread it you know in the street and see if people find it and listen to it this is a kind of this constitutive dissociation but the problem is, it, without the institutional framework to individualize the act, the act disappears, right? You will just find some tape there. This is not uh, an aesthetic act anymore. You cannot individualize it as a, an aesthetic act. And this is, a, this is the drama of the anarcho-realist maxim and of the Cajun gesture. This, this is a tragedy for this gesture in a certain sense. You see, uh, did I answer? <laughs> So, uh, what is anarchic in the anarcho-realist gesture is uh, the um, uh, annihilation of uh, inferential space. Of a I don't think it's annihilation of inferential space. I think it's, uh, the anarcho-realist maxim, as uh, Malik uh, talks about it, it's too bad that he doesn't have a text about it, but it, because we're discussing it, so it would be good to have really a full-fledged uh, written form uh, essay about this. But uh, but I'll send the, the playlist to you guys so you can watch it and discuss it for the next session. But uh, what is for me the, the, the anarcho in the anarcho-realist maxim is the fact that uh, art wants to go beyond the art institution. And this is both anarchist in a certain sense because it's going against a certain uh, for order that makes it what it is. And it's realist in the sense that it's trying to be the thing that it is about, 
and the aboutness of the work gets, you know, kind of uh, doubled in by the fact that it tries to be what it is about. So this is kind of the anarcho realist maxim. So uh, just to weave that back into the example of, you know, what you, what's interesting is, the, of course, of course, the, the, the literal uh, happening, the, the empirical order of explanation, order of uh, happenings is that Wallinger copied something that was out there in the con concrete reality, so to speak, to the museum. But the fact that he's doing it, it obeys the fact that he ought to be doing a certain form of art that is more real, less medium dependent and medium specific and institutionally defined thing. See? And uh, the paradox is that this is one of the most institutionally defined things now. So, and uh, yeah, so this is the basic problem here uh, that Murphy's, Shinnett Murphy is uh, uh, pointing at. I think Igor is uh, for quite some time trying to ask a question. <laughs> No, you're uh, muted. Are you listening to me? Yep. Uh, I was I was wondering if in, in this sense art seems to be ahead of the in terms of the protester, protestant, protestant. The protest, uh, yeah, the protest, protest. The political protest. protest yeah. uh, I think in, in this in this sense of uh, art, it seems to be ahead of the protestant rights in terms of political acting. But I was also wondering a uh, does, in this sense, art institution has, has more pr uh, political privileges than uh, atomized individuals that make political acts without uh, uh, recurring to the art institution. And but also I, I wrote it, uh, could we take advantage of, the, of this, of this, of this, like a frame that, that, uh, that is made possible to the art institution to make this act but also without uh, make uh, make the political act empty. And uh, uh, another question: How does this point? Uh, how does this uh, this political act or this empty empty state by the author point to the atomized state of the protester and put uh, put uh, and oppose in? It's more easier. How does this point to the atomized state of the protester as opposed to a grouping of the art institution? Like, even yeah, if the- Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, you, I, I feel that you are gesturing towards the idea that, you know, the art institution, because of its institutional, um, its institutional power has more, uh, I don't know, more, uh, uh, it's more potent than, you know, doing something on your own, yes, or the but the problem is not that uh, is not uh, the gradient of power, of course, that exists between one individual and an art institution. Of course, there is a gradient of power there. The problem is how this uh, the, the institutional the, the art institution is organized in a certain sense. So it's not just you know the fact that you uh, I don't know it, it, only from the only from the point of view of the gradient of power, of course, it is more uh, visible to do something within the institution than uh, from without. Uh, but the problem is once you get into the institution, you are marketed as art. And when you do that, uh, there is a neutralization of a certain different form of address that is possible in political dissent that is not the same. I wouldn't say it's not possible as maybe Shined would say, but it's not the same in the, in, the, in the art form. So there is something that has not to do with the empirical uh, gradient of power, but it has to do with the functional differentiation of the spheres that you can individualize through you know, this uh, inferential fabric in a certain sense. But of course, we'll have to, we'll have to flesh out this uh, during the seminar. That, that that's also made me, made me remember of this of this part of the text that I read this that I read this week. That is that is this October magazine that was uh, very very important to the theoretical approach of art, and it and it takes that any artistic practice that participates in concrete forms of political resistance will inevitably 
we will inevitably be soon subsumed into a debased propagandistic cultural form. Yeah. As, a as a result, contemporary art. But you know, you know, you know what, what's interesting. What you know what's interesting in that in that text is that oh, it will be subsumed under a propagandistic kind of thing. Uh, so it is still under the anarcho-realist maxim in the sense that it is asking of art to be like the protest. And this is what Sheenad Murphy is doing here. She's asking the art to be like the protest in a certain sense. Whereas maybe, the, as I was saying, the function of you know, political art is much more didactic than to be like the protest. And in that sense, more propagand propagandistic, we may have to, you know, be less wary and be less against propaganda in a certain sense. Maybe it's a good thing that you have like a kind of a propagandistic feature if you're doing a certain art form that has a, a definite address that is not just, you know, uh, illustrating through its own unfolding the art loop that we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. But I have to move on because okay. we are already like a, I have still just one one hour just to finish this. And Atefe wanted to ask a question. If if it's a short one, I can take it now. Atefe. No, 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 no. We can talk about it later. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So this is the the problem. So then there's the art loop or the question. But is it art? Is the most commonly associated with the Turner Prize? Then he should she starts talking about this. You know this. Uh, indiscernibles problem that was also already uh, there in Danto, the work of Arthur Danto, trying to define art in a certain sense through the appeal of uh, indiscernibles. And then, but uh, the problem is that the indiscernible is not just a philosophical device that Danto is using to define art. It is actually a happening in art, something that happened, right? So what, what Murphy end up, ends up saying is that the question, it, is it art, is the most commonly associated with the enterprise. So this, you know, is uh, indeterminate ontological purport becomes uh, the mainstream, as in its honoring works from a, from a cow preserved in formaldehyde to a light going on and off in one of its exhibition rooms. It appears to define itself by the defiant statement of it is art rather than by anything to do with the, equal, the quality or otherwise of works about which the question is it art would not arise. This is the point that I think kind of uh, Sheenad Murphy was kind of there's this critis, critique of you know the anarcho-realist maxim, but at the same time, it seems that uh, the anarcho-realist maxim is also motivating the critique. So anyway, so she called, she goes on, and it's not art; it is art. Seems to have dominated the field ever since. We might say then that art is stuck in a loop of staking a claim to itself and then having that claim contested in an intensity of navel gazing that prevents it from seeing anything but itself. So the problem is. Uh, the, the, the what's what's this interesting structure of what's going on is that uh, let us say the protest of course is addressed at something at the same time it's not it doesn't have an aboutness to it in the same sense that a work of art has when it is copied and transferred uh, as a work of art it has this aboutness the work is about the protest but the protest is not about the protest the protest is addressing a political problem the work of art is about the protest but the fact that the work of art is about the protest at the same time is uh, makes the work of art about the gesture of copying of its, its aboutness of the protest. And by doing that, you are caught in the art loop that is it art or is it not art in a certain sense. So it is the aboutness itself that kinds of close off art from the world in a certain sense within the art loop. So, then she goes on, nobody with any mindfulness of how would describe Wallinger's work, she's just mentioning a critique, right, that says it's a bold political statement, etc. Nobody with any mindfulness of how would describe Wallinger's work as a bold political statement. The irony of the claim is almost too painful to bear. It is rather an artwork made of a bold political statement or a bold political statement made into art and therefore no longer bold. So that the Stuckists, she's mentioned this group of people, Stuckists that are accusing uh, the government of, you know, uh, disappearing the art into life, which is kind of funny. Uh, feel that the rage of or indiscernibles represents a progression of art into life, gets it the wrong way around. Art that is concerned only about the loop. It's not art, it is art. The indiscernible is the most fitting site for this loop. 
functions much more consistently to remove art and the imaginative, intensible, and immediate resistance of which the creative, the artistic spirit is capable from life. Not really believe in that creative spirit, spirit but anyway. Uh, Parliament Square is clear again, free thinking resistance protest is hidden away in the art museum and life goes on as before. A disappearance of life into art, if you like, but certainly not a disappearance of art into life, which was, as I mentioned earlier, if you believe, for instance, Peter Bürger was the point of the avant garde disappearance of art into life, then uh, there is an introversion of that uh, in terms of a disappearance of life into art, which is kind of Murphy's uh, argument. So Murphy and Indiscernibles, in the transfiguration of the commonplace, Arthur Dante offers a thought experiment in which he imagines a series of physically identical objects, square painted in red. One is called red square. The second is called also red square. Square, I mean, the geographical uh, location, square, the geometrical object. Another is called Nirvana. The next is a canvas prepared by George Jordan for the realization of a painting. The last is a simple surface painted in red without any artistic intention. Danto tackles here the problem of the indiscernible, what characterizes a work of art in contrast to what characterizes any other type of artifact. What do the examples of uh, Danto and Murphy tells us in the context of this work? In the case of Danto, becoming work certainly results in the object gaining something in the process. As he points out in the introduction to his book, the work, according to him, is embodied meaning. Thus, it is the meaning factor that becomes a criterion of discrimination between the indiscernibles. The logical point in ensuring that A is not the same as B, then there must be a property F such as A is F and B is not F. It does not require that F be a perceptible property. So there's this property F that is not a perceptible property that A has that B does not have, right? This is the basic gist of the argument. This means that in the presence of objects that are not that are noticeably indiscernible, there must be a property which determines in the case one is a work of art and the other is not, a difference between such objects. This suggests there's a silent fourth strand in our argument, like we, as, as we were kind of uh, 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 saying in the beginning, like uh, the critique to indeterminacy, post cajun aesthetics and inferentialism, there's a far strange in our argument, which is the ontological problem of the definition of the artwork. And the sustainability was then a means for Danto to isolate the specific properties that would make indiscernibles discernible, which means it enables one to isolate a criterion that was then taken as essential for the work of art, the idea that it is an embodied meaning. But if you are to believe in Murphy, the criterion of aboutness of art that made art for Danto into a discussion of art itself is also the index of a lack of aboutness. By not addressing anything out of its own ontological conditions of definition, art becomes idle. So there's an interversion going on between you know, uh, the avant-garde and the neo-avant-garde in a certain sense, or the contemporary uh, version of the avant-garde, if we are to believe Shinet Murphy. Okay, is it clear? Reasonably? <laughs> okay. So Dante, Dante says this on being art. My aim has been essentialist to find the definition of art everywhere and always true. Essentialism and historicism are widely regarded as antithetical. Whereas I see them not only as compatible, but co-implicated with one another, at least in the case of art. It is a very fact, I believe, that there is an essence of art that makes artistic pluralism a possibility. But that means that art's essence cannot be identified with any of its instances, each of which must embody that essence, however little they resemble one another. What gave essentialism a bad name was precisely such an identification, as in the case of Ed Einhardt or Clement Greenberg. What made essentialism seem impossible was the condition of ultimate pluralism, since works of art had outward, outwardly so little in common. My contribution was to make plain that only when these extreme differences were available would one see the possibility of a single universal concept. So Dante has this Hegelian kind of argument that says it is in the point of the maximal atomization of works of art that one can see actually the concept of art operative. Otherwise, you would locate it 
uh, wrongly. You will locate it in medium specificity. You will locate it. You you would locate it in in different ways that are not uh, what it. He deems to be the essential concept of being embodied meaning, which means it is medium indifferent in a certain sense. So anything that come to be by being presented within the art world, come to embody a meaning and have an aboutness to it, become a work of art in a certain sense. So, but this is very limited in a certain sense. What's interesting in Murphy's argument uh, beyond uh, uh, the fact that we might agree or not with her is that there is also a different kind of aboutness that is part of a political protest that gets lost within the aboutness that is part of a artwork in a certain sense that can nevertheless still be political in a certain sense but doesn't have the same uh, the same uh, effects as a direct political protest so there is still an index of a distance between the thing being copied and the and the artwork in a certain sense, even if we don't want to go to the end of uh, and agree uh, with all of uh, Shinet's uh, Murphy's uh, argument. Okay. So uh, Cajun indeterminacy then. So Cajun indeterminacy is a further example of this. Just a second. Um, and then I, I start to uh, present what I think is a kind of a way out of this problem. Because in the face of it, Cage is, is a usual suspect of this, right? Like four minutes and 33 is basically a ready made in a certain sense. Why is it a ready made? Like it's getting, you know, uh, contingent happenings, contingent sounds to be a work of, or a work of art. It does so through a certain, uh, Specific, uh, 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 a specific uh, set of actions that has to illustrate this transformation. As, we, as I was saying, uh, just to declare that anything I'm listening is a work of art uh, is not visible in a certain sense. I was saying this regarding my friend's idea of you know, spreading his tapes around without a certain institutional, uh, an institutional framework that would uh, in not only present a work but individuate a work as it is, you see, the act gets lost in a certain sense. So the act is only the act that it is because it is already enmeshed within a certain set of actions that make it what it is. So uh, in the face of it, 453 is, a, is, a, is the same kind of work, but it needs to be uh, carried on in the, in the, in the, um, in the context of, you know, for instance, concert music presentations to be heard and to be seen, to be individuated. So I took this uh, paragraph from the text that I suggested as to read, like it's a very classic text, like the indeterminacy sub, sub chapter of the composition as process uh, by Cage in silence. So this is a lecture on composition, which is indeterminate with respect to its performance. That composition is necessarily experimental. An experimental action is one, the outcome of which is not foreseen. Being unforeseen, this action is not concerned with its axioms. Like the land, like the air, it needs none. A performance of a composition which is indeterminate of its performance is necessarily unique. It cannot be repeated. When performed for a second time, the outcome is other than it was. Nothing before is accomplished by such a performance, since that performance cannot be grasped as an object in time. A recording of such a work has no more value than a postcard. It provides a knowledge of something that happened, whereas the action was a non-knowledge of something that had not yet happened. So you have like a further kind of indeterminacy like a, that goes really deep here, like in the, to the point that this is, the action is a non-knowledge of something that hasn't yet happened. And as I was saying, this only can be brought about within a certain framework where such a thing can come to be. Otherwise, the non-knowledge of that which had not yet happened is not individuated as a relevant action because it is happening all the time, actually, right? So one could take, for instance, 433 as an example of such an indeterminate work, it is in a sense totally indeterminate. One can't immediately say that what counts as part of the work is the silence that is required, or the sounds that enter into the work as a result of what is required. 
So this is also a kind of a discussion in analytic philosophy that people have about this Cajun piece that, you know, what, what counts as, as, a, as an instance of poem in the 33? Is it a silence that the player, the performance must, must, must uphold? Or is it the fact that during this silence, there is no silence really, there's no other. There's only ideal silence. Concrete silence is sound. You are listening to sounds all the time. This is one point. And if B, which is the you know, standard interpretation, is the case, if B is the case, which is the idea that the sounds that enter into the work are as a result of what is recorded is the work, uh, one can't really predict what will be sounding within the framework of the work. Right? If, if B is the case, you can't predict what will, what will happen. Consider as a kind of frame, four minutes 33 could be said to anticipate gestures like what is just that which is outside work becomes part of work by the framing of, the, of such contents. A further similarity of Wallinger's with Wallinger's gesture will be pointed at by the end of today's exposition. Oh, I'll get there. I see the chat is very active, but uh, I'm not sure if I want to open it right now. So let me just finish this cage bit and we'll take, take some, some questions. So there is a history though, to the adoption of this, you know, ideological, uh, picture of indeterminacy. What I, th I find is really striking in the cage, in cage text is that uh, the whole text, um, the whole text is kind of against its ending, right? The ending is like, oh, this is a known knowledge. This is com something completely um, uh, undefined, et cetera, et cetera. We can't really take this in the face of it because uh, the the, the, what the text is showing is that there is a method to bringing about such effect, right? So this is why I'm calling cage from structure to chance to indeterminacy. So in this text, he's discussing the differences between, you know, having a certain structure and having a result that is uh, determined by chance and having an indeterminate result, which are three different things. This is a lecture on composition, which is indeterminate with respect to its performance. In intersection three by Morton Feldman, uh, the intersection three by Morton Feldman is an example. The music of changes is not an example. Music of changes is one of his seminal works that you know uh, it's all through composed, it's all defined. If you if you, if you get a score, it's pretty hard to play. But uh, if you listen to different performances, you will listen to the same thing. Right? But the, all the gestures are determined by chance, which is different from indeterminate result. I'll take Mrs. Love uh, question in a moment. Just let me finish this slide. Uh, in the music of changes, structure, which is the division of the whole into parts, method, which is the note-to-note -note procedure, form, which is the expressive content, the morphology of the continuity, the materials, the sounds and silences of the composition are all determined. I took this both also because we have to understand that Cage worked with these four criteria. Structure, the division of the whole into parts. Method, the note to note procedure. Form, which is content. For Cage, form is content. <laughs> which is expressive content, the morphology of the continuity. The way things are uh, continuous with one another. This makes it, makes it a form, which is not structure for him and materials, the sounds and silences of the composition, what, that which you are choosing from to be in the composition, okay? These are all determined. Though no two performance of the music of change will be identical. He quotes René Schatz, it actually, each act is version even the repeated one. Two performances will resemble one another closely. Though chance operations brought about the determinations of the composition, these operations are not available in its performance. The function of the performance in the case of the music of changes is that of a contractor who following an architect's blueprint constructs a building that the music of changes was composed by means of chance operations identifies the composer with no matter what eventuality. I like this formulation, like it identifies someone or some, some part of the diagram with, with the eventuality, right? And the other and the other parts have different functions. For instance, the function of the performer here is of a contractor. It's weird, right? Like it's, it's, all, it's all differentiated and all functionally differentiated and functionally defined. 
So a cage divides composition in four elements, structure, method, form, and material, as I was saying. Another example in the art of field structure, which is the division of the one twice, method, which is a node to node procedure. And he repeats, he repeats this paragraph, and then the, uh, the structure of the paragraph each time, right? Don't need to um, repeat it again. This progressive overcoming of determinate results can be understood from this untethering of each element from others and from the choices and tastes of the composer. For instance, in his early period compositions for percussion orchestra, the predetermined rhythmic structure was filled with materials, method, and form that were spontaneously chosen by the composer. Spontaneity is not indeterminacy, right? Things will, will start to get indetermined when they are not spontaneous, which is kind of weird also. So uh, the, fact, the thing is, in, in his uh, percussion compositions, which was more, more uh, traditional compositions like the, the cage produced, you had like a predetermined uh, uh, section, shapes. You have like a section that is longer than another, that is shorter, this kind of thing. He yeah. had predetermined numerical sequences that determined the, the, the sizes of the different sections. And uh, he knew that he ought to have like a section that is longer than the other one. There is a kind of a balance that was produced uh, in this way, this pre-compositional grid that was the structure. And he then filled this pre-compositional grid with the three different things, materials. He has to choose the materials if the, if the of course, if it, is, if, if it was a piece for uh, percussion orchestra, it would be the, sounds that the orchestra can be producing, right? The method, which is how you get from sound A to sound B, which is kind of an interesting thing that comes from serial organization. He's, he was a student of Schoenberg as well. And form, which is this, you know, sounding shape, the morphology of continuity, right? These were spontaneous. The, th the, the, the defined thing was structure at first. And then, for instance, in the string quartet in four parts, in four parts, I, I made a playlist of this, so you will have it after in the Google Classroom. I cannot play copyrighted material, as you know. Um, in the string quartet in four parts, in addition to predetermined rhythmic structure, materials were predetermined by the use of a technique of a gamut. Sound combinations were assembled in an alphabet to be combined by form and method inside a predetermined structure. What's an alphabet of materials? It's a weird notion, right? Yeah, he just composed like different chords, different sonorities. He had like a list, a set of sonorities, predetermined sonorities that he could uh, put in different orders within the composition. If you listen to this string quartet in four parts, you listen to the same sonorities coming back and forth all the time, but not in the same order. This is what, what's interesting. He will compose different, different phrases with different sound objects that were pre-composed, uh, assembled from the sonorities that can be provided by a string quartet. Okay. And uh, then in his concerto for prepared piano and orchestra, the gamut, which is this technique, this set of different sonorities, was replaced by a bi-dimensional chart with predetermined sound combinations in each square of the chart. The piano was spontaneously written against the orchestra, which was determined by the chart in the first movement. So the orchestra, the sounds of the orchestra, they had like this predetermined chart and he could uh, make moves. It's like a, almost like a game. You have this chart and you can either follow one sonority that's here with the one left of it or the one right of it or the one above it or the one below it, you see. He could use even uh, chance operations to determine which move will be next in the orchestra. And the piano was uh, spontaneously composed as a reaction against what was the result of these chance operations in the orchestra. But it was through composed. The orchestra has to play what is written. It's not indeterminate music. So piano in the first movement was written against the orchestra, which was determined by the chart. In the second movement, piano and orchestra were determined each other by a diff, each, sorry, each by a different chart. There was a one chart for the piano, one chart for the orchestra. In the third, both were determined by the, the same chart. So you have like this synthesis, this, this you know, uh, successive process of synthesis going on in this piece. In the third, both were determined by uh, the same chart. 
In addition to the progressive determination of the piano, movements between sonorities, which is the method, were also determined by each ing operation, so to overcome choice by the composer. Structure, method, form, and materials were then untethered from the states, from the tastes of the composer. The freedom of the composer lies in asking the questions, the answer to which will be determined according to chance operations. Like the following, uh, following question, what now? What sound the orchestra will do now? You use the I Ching, you determine which part of the chart and you read, write it back into the score. So this is composition uh, determined by chance operations. The fact is that the score is determined and you have to repeat it in performance, which is different from the indeterminate score that does not yield the recognizable, repeatable result. This is the basic difference. So finally, for me, in 33, a predetermined structure is to be filled with whatever materials, methods, and form that may appear during performance. This is crucial. For instance, uh, think, think, of, think of four minutes 33 in the following way. As I was saying in the percussion pieces, there were different sizes of time lengths that were determining sections, right? Four minutes 33 is just one, one such structure, but without any Feeling, it's just a structure. The first score of four minutes through the three was a bunch of pauses. He determined the structure and filled it with pauses. This is the first score of four minutes through the three, not the one that everybody knows that has like one, two, three in tackets, play nothing, which, which looks like a conceptual piece. But the first, the first version was a kind of a, a traditional score, but uh, comprised only of pauses, which means the structure is determined and it is filled with whatever. Actually, it is filled with silence. If again we ask the analytical question of what is 433, is it just what is asked or, or is it the result of what is asked, of what is required? If it is the result of what is required, it means the materials, method, and form will appear in performance. But what is crucial, it will not appear as the result of any. Uh, self-expressive uh, uh, gesture by any performer. It will appear just because of the imminence of our sounding world. So this is crucial for Cage. The Cajun question then, what should be destroyed so that nature can appear in its manner of operation? Which is a, a formulation of a Brazilian philosopher that was a teacher of mine, Vladimir Safatli. He asked this, this question, what should be destroyed so that nature can appear in its manner of operation? Which is at this point, the function of art for cage, the imitation of nature in its manner of operation. But it's important that it is in its manner of operation, not in its sensible phenomenal appearing qualities, right? So the destruction of the compositional ego is supposed to open the work to the imminence of what happens. What does happen? Sound themselves, free of organization or spontaneously organized by nature. Again, let us, let us, uh, let us uh, uh, um, leave nature underdefined, right? Just like a function of determination that is different from the organization of an artwork, okay? as, as I was saying before. Otherwise we'll be caught in the definition of nature, which is a different problem. The artwork is supposed not to be made for the synthetic activity of the listener either both listener and composer must surrender themselves to a convent not made by and for them. Imitating nature in its manner of operation is then freeing sounds from the organizing slash composer. Okay. I was going to take Mr. Slav's question. Do you want to make that question, Mr. Slav, before I proceed? Yes, I want to make a question concerning, uh, concerning the lecture, concerning the Example from the K, uh, from Cage, uh, which follows uh, his example of, of Morton Feldman, namely yep. concerning his father, the inventor. Uh, when mm -hmm. he says that uh, for his father, the best work is done when uh, sound asleep. And uh, this led me to the question of, uh, so to say, metaphysical framework, uh, more from philosophy, not from art. Since I have recalled uh, the phenomenon, not phenomenon, a historical anecdote 
uh, known as Kekulé's dream. Do you know that phenomenon? No, I don't think so. Uh, Friedrich August Kekulé was a German a chemist, theoretical chemist, uh, who in the um, 19th century, um, his uh, most known uh, works are on the structure of benzene. And he has seen this uh, structure uh, in, a, in a dream, in a non-verbal symbol of Ouroboros uh, and so on and so forth. And this uh, led him to reconsider mm -hmm. the previous, uh, previous theoretical findings on the structure of benzene and led to some revolutionary stuff in chemistry. I don't want to deep into it, uh, but mm -hmm. what I want to say, uh, as far as I remember, if I remember correctly, uh, Lacan poses that uh, unconscious is structured as language. Uh, and uh, this case of Kekulé dreams, uh, Kekulé's dream is taken by Cormac Makati. Uh, it's, he's known more like a writer, but he's also the research fellow in Santa Fe Institute, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, um, McCarthy, poses not just um, another opinion, he just contra Lacanian. He says that uh, at no way language and the unconscious are some way uh, intersect or so, some way connected. He just says, um, I will quote him, the unconscious is a biological uh, operative and language is not. And uh, the question I want to pose is either to your position concerning the relation between the unconscious and language. And um, what do you think Cage thinks on that, on uh, the connection between language and the unconscious? So is he uh, or and you uh, more Lacanian or more pro uh, Makati? Makati? Yeah. Uh... I I I have, I have difficulty uh, answering that in Lacanian in the Lacanian framework. I'm not really sure where where the things I do fall within the Lacanian framework. This is something that I want to I want to uh, examine further. I, I'm not prepared to give it an answer right now about this. But uh, regarding Cage, uh, I'll say that Cage would not think that uh, it is language. The unconscious is language. Uh, so maybe that would kind of indirectly answer your question because I would say it is. <laughs> I mean, in the Cajun practice, by means of the by means of the examination of Cajun musical practice, I think there is a form of language operative in Cajun musical practice that Cage does not want to oppose. So if I f if if what if we take it, let us let us for for uh, debate purposes accept that once the tastes of the composer, the conscious decisions of the composer were, was, were, was, uh, are artificially taken out of the picture, as we, saw, as we said, it is artificial, it's kind of a very structured set of action. Uh, what appears is unconscious. Uh, for me, uh, this is, there is a part of it that is an appearance of something that is unconceptualized, but it is brought upon conceptually, right? Whereas Cage, I don't know if Cage would uphold the same uh, reading because what's important for Cage is to take the ego or the self out of uh, circulation. Whereas I see, I think that a logical self is always, uh, always calling the card here, even if they, it's not an empirical self, but we'll discuss this specifically in the fourth session. I have a, a text of mine about this. Uh, this issue of uh, the suspension of subjectivity in Cajun uh, practice. So I think that would be what I can say for now. Not sure if I, if if it's much it's, it's much uh, helpful, but I'd say wait a little bit, and by the end of the seminar we can have a further discussion about these issues. Okay. Yes, um, um, I'm. In fact, I. I agree with you, uh, except for I, I suppose that Cage thinks of unconscious in some symboli symbolical manner, where the symbol is something uh, in between the language and the nonverbal reasoning, to which uh, Makati, for example, appeals. Uh, I'm, not sure. says, I'm not sure about that. He, uh, 
I think uh, Cage is guilty of falling into the myth of the given for Ursulizen. Like he thinks that there, there is a way to open the world to a non-conceptualized, non-symbolized, immanent multiplicity. This immanent multiplicity, the sound of the world or something like that. The, the thing is anybody's listening to these sounds as, as sounds of a certain sort. There are sort of restrictions at place from the, from the uh, listener's end. And there are uh, limitations put, put forward by the composer or the artist that frame these sounds in a certain way. Otherwise, they won't be even individuated as part of a certain thing, right? Namely, a certain work or a certain uh, aesthetic proposal. So, uh, but yeah. I see the, the symbols are, uh, are themselves a sort of a given. Okay, yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, Rodolfo, uh, and oh my God, I won't be, I won't be finishing this today. Perhaps, come on, go on, Rodolfo. Oh, Very quick, oh, if you can. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I, I was just thinking about uh, um, all the idea of liberation that has to has to do with this uh, grasping of Sam Buddhism that is. Uh, Surround or that surrounds the practice of John Cage also because uh, first of all what I what I think is that uh, what we understand as language and is, um, if it is individual or is it a uh, um, social organization or for even... us for, I mean this is I can I can answer you right away for for me there's a presupposition here at, at place that it is a social social thing is not individual. Yeah, and, and the, but also it reminds me of the uh, idea of the Zen Buddhism that uh, it's part of the Mahayana practice of the there's no individual liberation, but it has to do with uh, all all beings are going to be awakening like at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and and I, yeah. I think that there's like a connection there that might be. Yeah, there is. There is because for Cage, the, the individual is not being liberated. It's not about the individual being liberated exactly. It's about actually, 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 it's about the individual being liberated by the illusion of individuality of its own tastes and things like that. So it's a kind of a discipline. What I what I admire about Cage is that there is a discipline, a very strict discipline there in order to to, to bring these effects, like uh, to accept that which is not beholden by your own taste, the composition that you would like it to be like that and that and that. This is. This is Cajun indeterminacy, but it is dependent upon a certain discipline. It's not just indeterminacy or, you know, anything goes or this kind of thing that the critique of indeterminacy usually is criticizing really like a, a certain indeterminacy, ontological indeterminacy of the work. And the problem is that sometimes Cage lends himself to that kind of reading, like he could be like easily a target for Trinidad Mercy or, or Sohail Malik because of certain uh, formulations that he comes up with. But if you look closely to the practice, and this is kind of my polemical thing against Cage, like if you look closely to the practice, the practice, uh, the practice says different things from the philosophy. Cage's philosophy does not reflect what is done. What is done has a different philosophy from what is said of what is done, you see. So, and people get caught in this, oh no, Cage, the guy that wants to you know, free the forces of chaos and all that. Okay, okay, we can, we, can, we can go along with this idea, free the forces of chaos, but this only comes, this is only comes about through a very intense uh, discipline and a normative framework that is proposed for this specific yeah, end. You see, he, yeah. he seeks for liberation through framing also that it's like kind of contradictory contradictory or somehow yeah. or at first sight at least i guess mm. yeah yeah so i have to go on uh, akshat also i would like i'll do this very quickly so with four or 33 and like i studied an unhealthy amount of cages poetry and um as you can see like his other big thing which is like chance and uh, the construction of the mesostic. Um, mm -hmm. When I look at 430, I first, uh, like, if like it was being performed in uh, front of me, my first instinctual response would be to yell something, like very loudly during the yeah. performance of the piece. 
and like um, with respect to uh, indeterminacy there is always like this uh, given assumption that um silent like there is a uh, when we think about silence or even i feel at some points when cage thinks about silence the uh, like n- it's not a void but it's also not excessive noise it is yeah. um maybe the breathing of the people who are in the audience it's uh, the rustling of the cloth against uh, other cloth it's um, mm. it's uh, a misplaced cough uh, but like and i don't mean to sound ableist here but what if uh, someone with uh, tourettes is in the audience or um, let's say uh, it does not even have to be tourettes but someone who um is very jumpy with respect to it because i don't think cage accounts for that or at least uh, performance p- people who've performed cage up to now they've not yeah. done this because like i've seen 5 to 10 portions of the piece yeah, and yeah. not there sorry 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 to interrupt you this because you are you are touching upon points that i will address shortly so i think the best way to to answer to you is to continue because i'll talk exactly about this issue Right. Uh, when you when you talk about indeterminacy, there is also this uh, idea that anything goes, like it's open to everything, and it is not open to everything either. So, as you said, like if if somebody yells in the performance, is that part of the is, is that is that as acceptable? Is that something that can be accounted by the framework of four minutes and thirty three seconds? This is an open question. This is there's a no. Uh, on the face of it, would say yes, yes. It's so anything that ha- anything that happens may enter the piece, but it's not it's not really exactly like that. And also for inferential reasons. So I'll be I'll be addressing this in a minute. Thank you for the for the question because it's anticipating actually what I want to talk about. Okay, so let me just uh, go on and, and we'll you, we'll convey afterwards. So uh, then. Uh, then we have like this idea of form becomes content inferential art, right? like Daniel Schall, which is the Cajun French guy, the French Heideggerian philosopher that was kind of the advocate for Cajun in, in France. It's for, it says about uh, four minutes 33, its first aspect is that of a joke. Only the listener cannot stop there because the work contains more than this. It raises doubt as to the very location. Uh, was it happening on the stage or in the woods? Was was not it rather on the roof or in the room? So then I jumped to Costellanes. Uh, while the traditional viewer could not have declared that the piece of cage did not contain a musical note, as soon as he grasps the inferences, the implications of 4 minutes and 33 seconds, it becomes obvious to him that all he could have perceived within these 4 minutes and 30 seconds is an integral part of the piece. So you have like a process of reasoning, right? The first degree in determinacy here is just a means to an end. The silence is just a trigger for the inferential process of testing different assumptions about what is happening. In that sense, indeterminacy is not the end result, but the beginning as suspension of already given conceptual determinations. It gives way to the work of determination as test and run hypothesizing. Like this is what the inferential art is doing in, in the Costellanis uh, idea, right? Like. Uh, it has a thesis, and, and in order to grasp the thesis, you have to test different uh, assumptions about what you're listening, or what you're seeing. Okay. Uh, so this is just a very, very simple first concept of inferential art that is not still inferentialist, but it's just, just the, the Costellanis idea of an inferential art. So four minutes and 33 is not just an experience of this sounding imminence, it is also a reasoning process. So the indeterminacy that suspends the shape of our traditional musical work uh, starts the process of a searching protocol, starts a searching protocol of what is it that I'm seeing, like that asks what, I, what is it that I'm seeing, right? Which is interesting. So a further example that has all, everything to do with what Akshat was saying. So this is a this is a, this is an example of minus. This is this is part of my book, my 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 thesis. I remember an interesting experience that I had at a Vandal Weiser concert in Paris. Uh, people who know me already listen to this a lot, so bear with me. Uh, in 2012, 
a group of composers mostly based in Switzerland and Germany who use Cajun silence as material for composition. I mean Cajun silence, not just silence, which means composition is something that is part of the sounding environment, right? Randall Weiser's music is often characterized as silent music due to the enormous number of pauses that, that, that is I translated it from the French, so the translation is not very good, sorry, that characterize it. Ensemble Dedalus uh, performed works by Antoine Boyger, Hadou Malfatti, Jürgen Frey, and, and Michael Pizarro in a kind of shed that was part of the Instant Chaviré, a space dedicated to noise and experimental music located in Montreuil, just outside Paris. It was cold, and the shed intentionally had no heating. So the idea was to have interpenetration. You read the cage text, so interpenetration without obstruction is the important thing. So it was very well thought out. They turn off the heating. It is winter, so it's cold in the concert venue. And there is sound of uh, traffic. There were leaks in the space and the sound of traffic outside, which was discreet enough to interpenetrate itself amidst the silence of the pieces without obstructing the listening of the sounds that unfolded in the performance space. During the execution of one of the pieces, a car alarm goes off and produces a high amplitude and invasive sound during the performance. An impasse is created. The music continues for a while, but the alarm prevents any relation to what is being produced on the stage, so to speak. Musicians end up deciding to stop playing and wait for the alarm to go away before starting the piece again, which is weird, right, for occasion practice. At first, the decision seems normal to us. In any work in the concert tradition, if an extremely invasive sound is continuously produced in the audience, the tendency would be to stop and wait to start the interrupted music at some point. But what matters precisely is the meaning of such a decision within a practice that wants to be permeable to what happens, like it wants to interpenetrate with uh, non-intentional happenings, which wants to be open to any occurrences, an arc realist maxim, maxim again, which wants to be open to any occurrences, seeking to welcome them. In this case, shouldn't the alarm have been integrated? The alarm was perceived as an external element and it was decided to eliminate it from performance. If there is an adherence to the Cajun concept of nature within the Vandal Weiser practice, one can ask whether this nature really encompasses what happens, whether there is a possible limit to the integration. Ultimately, if a meteor were to fall into the performance space, the event would have to be stopped as well. Indeed, it would be. So uh, this is an example of what uh, Akshat was kind of asking. Like, is that it doesn't seem to embrace the world, so to speak, as, as Mahler said about his symphonies. It seems to be just, uh, it, it, it seems to have like a limit uh, of possible integration, even in a, uh, performance practice, an aesthetic proposal that wants to be open to whatever happens. It's not really whatever, because if Cage is thinking of Core Minus and 33 as something that is being uh, performed within a concert music situation, there are already certain protocols and certain uh, ideas of, or a certain idea of what may, may be there as a sound input to the composition. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the end, we have 10 minutes, so I think we'll uh, get, get to the end, straight to the end now. Few consequences follow. First, the consideration of indeterminacy as purely phenomenal happening, the nature of which is indeterminate, elides the process by which its indeterminate nature is recognized. So the first part of the answer was the inferential art thing, it's already produced through a certain inferential diagram, right? Second, the above phrasing already points to a process of reasoning by which a work like this is experienced. Costellanis makes a, a very interesting case. Unfortunately, maybe we won't have the time to discuss it here. For inferential art as being different from conceptual art somewhat, while its sensible characteristics for Costellanis' ontological features, more on this in a moment, are not the most important element. He understands the ontological features as you know the sensible ones. His works can be full-fledged, through-composed, and determined, and yet be inferential in the sense of illustrating a certain aesthetic thesis. While there would be much work to be done to make this idea rigorous, 
It points to the inferential tracking of aesthetic ideas that is part and parcel of artworks. Third, to say that any artwork functioned inferentially would perhaps risk losing the specificity of the properly inferential artwork, the artwork that is, you know, overtly inferential. The works commented upon in this seminar are not exclusively inferential in the sense of being purely inferential. Of course, they all have phenomenal properties and ought to yield a phenomenal output. And in the sense of being the only inferential ones, it's not just because they are, uh, uh, they, they make explicit the inferential infrastructure that they, they are the only ones that are inferential, but they make explicit inferential articulation through their structuring, retroactively suggesting the inferential organization of traditional works. Suggesting, I'm not sure about this is an hypothesis, okay? Uh, final consequence is the limitation one can recognize to the ideological Cajun assumption of openness. One of the example shows a counterexample to openness that shows the closure of the work, even when a morphological trait of integration of its outside is part of the aesthetic proposal. It functions here as a further indiscernible example that shows not the change in status of an outside object becoming art, but the adaptation the work makes to the environment once it wants to integrate it. Not the change suffered from the point of view of the object that is integrated in the art practice, but the change imposed by the integrating gesture on the environment. If Cajun nature as appearing in works can't accept loud noises, is Cajun nature necessarily well behaved? Like, is it like a French garden, something like that? This is kind of a very destructive, very destructive uh, hypothesis regarding what Cage wants to do, right? So on morphological limits. So here is kind of the gist of what I was developing in the PhD, like the morphology of, of works, right? So uh, here's a, a quote from Cardio, that is a big, huge inspiration in that project. And uh, Valerio Fiel da Costa, who's a Brazilian, uh, composer friend of mine that also uh, unfortunately his work is in Portuguese otherwise I would use it in this seminar but I, I have this quote here that I uh, translated so Cardio says consequence of this comes the fundamental difference in thinking about the identity of a piece of music for instance constituting the identity of an European piece here is dealing with the difference between you know experimental power practice as Michael Nyman said that was the anglo-saxon uh, experimental music school and the european you know post-renaissance uh, idea of you know in the, uh, the identity of a work being univocally uh, 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 individuated so the identity of a uh, traditional let, let's say the identity of a traditional piece are the tones that occur in it and the characteristics pitch loudness length etc in bullets for example are the themes that occur in it, their implications, harmonic and melodic and modifications, etc., etc. On the other hand, constituting the identity of, for instance, winter music, which is a cage indeterminate piece, is the fact that there should be more or less complex eruptions into silence, and that these should come from one or more pianos. It was already doing this exercise, like trying to see in each composition, what is left open and what is in what is left uh, determined, which is the typically morphological way of doing it, like uh, locate within a certain aesthetic proposal, the degree of its openness and the parameters that are open, the parameters that are determined, right? And Cardio is very good in that. We'll read uh, his on the role of instructions in the determinant music next, uh, next uh, in the next session. So, and Valerio says, there are many more forces of morphological disaggregation operating on the work than forces of conservation. Nothing prevents an individual from playing a work in a way that frustrates the expectations of the author of his, or his project, either due to technical incapacity or due to a challenge to the order, negligence or, or distraction. An entire system of ethics had to be established to reduce such danger by granting an individual or group precedence over others and constituting themselves as reference capable of imposing order and keeping the musical work on its axis. So musical work is the result of a normative infrastructure. Here, what is really revealed by indeterminacy is not the outside, but the conditions of determination of an inside. 
conditions that in order to obtain should result from a certain institutional pragmatic infrastructure that is the job of the following sessions to uncover. From this point of view, the inferential purport in art is not separated as Postelatus wanted from the ontological one in his understanding. To say this would be to uphold a form of ontological aesthetic empiricism that identifies identity with sheer repeatable aesthetic appearance. Ontology understood as a way to capture what is specific to a certain domain of objects of experience, for objects are the result of practices, uh, should elaborate inferential commitments in order to be able to constitute said domains theoretically. Inferential being is ontological being in the case of artifacts. Uh, yeah, this is the end. We have three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, any comments? There's a, I know there's like 50 messages in the chat. I won't be able to just read them off right now. If there is something uh, relevant that one, uh, anybody wants to say, it's good. Arman. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I typed my question. I try to articulate a little better. Uh, as I understand you, Actually, I hear you. I heard you talk about this idea. So maybe this is your idea that I'm uh, only mirroring. But uh, bear with me. Uh, in uh, for uh, in Cage's uh, idea, in Cage's um, um, piece, um, what becomes part of the um, part of the work is uh, exactly the normative. Uh, structure, structures and behaviors and even et social etiquettes of people who are um, who are there or go, uh, who are interpreting the piece at, at that moment or who are behaving near the event that is the um, that is the piece that is uh, being recorded uh, and this also holds for um, the other uh, I think example about uh, the protest art uh, uh, near the parliament or whatever that it was um, mm -hmm. I, I think there also this idea of um, if I understand, oh, I am, oh, I'm, I'm, put it, I'm also a little bit illiterate about um, artistic matters. So maybe this is the indeterminacy that we are talking about. Uh, if this is the indeterminacy, actually we are detecting, we are detecting something else, not indeterminacy. We are detecting the very structure of what we call arts institution or uh, uh, something like that, social social institution. Not maybe, not not maybe the whole of it, but it, it is like a void, a laboratory, uh, in a laboratory situation for detecting what yeah. what becomes uh, arts work. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is this was this was my project, really. Uh, uh, of course, this 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 says very little about indeterminacy. In fact, right, like indeterminacy becomes something that is defined in relation to a certain framework. Like an indeterminacy is not really a, an ontological indeterminacy, as I don't know uh, certain metaphysics would have it, but an indeterminacy is just a suspension of a protocol. Like you suspend certain protocols and certain deter so certain determinate protocols in order for something to appear, something else to appear. And uh, as I was trying to illustrate with the description of uh, you know the unfolding of, Kate, of John Cage's own compositions, this was pretty pretty conscious. Like the the fact that he was he was using restrictions, constraints, very very specific constraints. I will fill the structure with spontaneous sounds. No, I won't fill the structure with spontaneous sounds. I will, I will use a gamut. The gamut will prevent me from uh, expressing myself in the sounding result, for instance. These are very specific and disciplined protocols to bring about certain forms of indeterminacy that uh, appear as an opportunity for something else to appear, something that is not beholden to my own taste of what I, what I like, my empirical subject, that is. But you need, anyway, uh, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> you need, anyway, uh, uh, I lost myself. Uh, yeah, you need, anyway, an infrastructural, uh, an infrastructural uh, scaffolding in order for something to be like this, to, to be brought about 
and also to be individuated. Otherwise, the act would be dissolved in, you know, the happenings of the world. Akshat was uh, one final, 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 final conversation. Can I, can I ask a quick, um, a quick question before I'm um, um, uh, just about the last, of, uh, the last question, uh, the last uh, point that you made? Uh, do you think that there is a place that we can, we can, um, uh, we can detect something similar in, uh, for example, philosophy of, philosophy of language or any field like that? That is, we, yep. can, we can detect the source. Uh, if, if so, can, can, you, can you talk about it a little bit? Sorry to take, take up time. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the idea. Thank you, Arma. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll book after the session. Uh, we can, I mean, uh, please, I have to say that, please uh, uh, accept the invitation to the Google Classroom because then our 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 communication is easier and we can book uh, presentations for the next sessions, right? I'm I'm putting together also a, a, a further further reading. Sorry, Akshat. Uh, yeah, do you want to? To make your question already? Sorry, go on, go on. Um, it was less of a question and more of maybe an addition to what Arman was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, because like what my thinking was that, let's say there is a, a piece of classical music and uh, it, it could be something by Beethoven, it could be something by Bach. And like uh, the work that present day orchestras are doing, at least uh, the avant-garde uh, orchestras, is uh, interpreting it in radically new ways. Like, uh, and maybe uh, the differences are like, not, uh, they can't exactly pick in how uh, the silences are being played, let's say. But if the original composers, um, let's say Mozart was to hear his pieces performed, there is a very real possibility that he would be very unhappy. With how yeah, it was yeah. being interpreted today. This is this is today. This is taken... That is the. Sorry, go on. Sorry, yeah, sorry, so go on. why not make John unhappy? Like, uh, if we, we are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, making Mozart unhappy, why not make John kids unhappy? And like, if we uh, have a cover of 433, which is uh, being performed by, let's say, um, an avant garde. Uh, jazz quartet who's playing at a construction site or uh, at a street corner, then I think uh, like there, it, I think it maybe depends upon the interpretation of the musicians uh, as much like I, I, it's just about how much uh, control or authority do we give the composer over their own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not only the composer, for instance. Then you have like a set of different concepts that uh, unfortunately it's not really, maybe I could, I could bring them in into the seminar. I just want to crowd too much the seminar with, you know, too much things. As you, as you have noticed, I try to keep the readings very short. Next time we'll, we'll, there will be a, like a Wilfred Sellers very dense uh, paper to, to tackle, which is already much. But for instance, there are, there are several concepts that have a regulative role here. For instance, the concept of work. In music, this is, for instance, if you read uh, Lydia Gerr, uh, Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, uh, it's a very interesting book about the emergence of the work concept in the 19th century. And uh, the idea there that uh, there is a practice that they organized, uh, crystallized a certain concept, uh, the concept of work, mu uh, musical work artistic work or musical work that ought to be respected and ought to be brought about uh, uh, the instructions that uh, that constitute ought to be respected. So, and this of course has a technological and technical um, ways of, of bringing that about. Like for instance, the advances in musical notation in copyright issues, it has to do also with the fact that composers were becoming, you know, uh, 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 to say that uh, uh, they are not they are not servants anymore. They have to they have to compete in the market. For instance, when they have to compete in the market, their works have to be respected because they represent what they are selling in a certain sense. So it's very important uh, to also keep in mind that it's not just a, it's not just a, a whim uh, to respect or not the will of the composer. It is also 
a certain historical sets of uh, actions that are in place that, for instance, makes a musical work a work in a certain sense. Of course, we are always, we always have the chance to discover we, if we, I don't know if, if Mozart could, as you said, travel to our times, maybe he would hate the performances. But anyway, uh, the fact is that there is a causal relationship between the, what was what was determined in the time of Mozart and a certain ongoing practice that is able to retrieve up to a point a certain morphology that was intended by Mozart. So yeah, this is the this is a, the the gist of which I, I would say not only uh, will the will of the composer, but it is a, a normative infrastructure that is a historical, ongoing uh, structure that keeps certain things meta stable, and others are able to be revised and. I'd say during this, you know, this seminar that you know, consultative dissociations are a way to come up with different kinds of stability as well. And I, I would redefine then indeterminacy as a kind of uh, consultative dissociation, not as indeterminacy in the ontological sense that some people want to uphold. Right? This is the idea. So I, I have, I think we have to go, right? I think there uh, were some... uh, yes, I yeah, think the session again. has to end like in the next two, three minutes. But if people yeah. still want to resume the session on Zoom and talk to each other, you're you're free to do so. But I will finish the recording in the next two recording. minutes. If there isn't anything else that you would like to say, JP. No, I think, um, yeah, I, okay, think I, I think I covered everything for today. I mean, if you yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll have plenty of time. Can I just now. like to say one sentence uh, like so um, with respect to Mozart what I would say is if you look at the Requiem and uh, Requiem is an open work that was left unfinished so yeah, excuse my uh, finished right so uh, mm -hmm. there is this uh, like I would, wouldn't even call it a radical idea but there are performances of the Requiem where only the parts that Mozart wrote are performed and everything mm -hmm. else that other people tried to fill in or uh, like tried to complete it like in a certain way is not, it's left out. Only the pieces that Mozart left behind are performed. So um, in this respect, uh, maybe uh, works that are open and in, um, in a certain way that cages 433 or any silent pieces open, maybe they are more immutable or like maybe I'm not not very yeah, sure. Yeah, that's about interesting. It, but... That's interesting hypothesis. We'll, we'll, I should delve into it next session. We'll see about it. Yeah. No, I don't care about the birthday. Thank you, Atafe. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I, don't, I have anything. I have nothing to do today. So anyway, uh, I, actually, I, I was glad to teach during my birthday. This is the best birthday I had. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, as so, you know, yeah. Uh, do we have any documents where we can? Uh book the presentations yeah this is with yeah. guilherme guilherme do you have those at, at documents a table no yeah, can well, you hear well. me? uh the internet went down for a bit oh, okay okay oh, yeah I, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm going to email everyone with a, with an Excel sheet and everyone can uh, sign up for the presentations of the upcoming sessions. Okay, Thank you. Uh, I would add that I, I'm, I'm, I'm assembling a further reading folder. So if anybody wants to address something in the further reading folder in their presentations, it is helpful. This is, this is a way also that you can participate in the definition of the subjects covered. I, other than you know the basic argument being uh, unfolded here in this seminar. Uh, there's also a, a Discord with this class, so if anyone would like to share some music or uh, art that uh, uh, refers to the topics that we're discussing, feel free to share. It would be nice to to see what people come up with as well. And if you don't mind, I'm going to finish the recording now. Yeah, but I'll leave the Zoom session okay. open for a bit if, if you want to continue talking. And yeah, it was lovely to meet you all and to have this first session.
And of course, happy birthday to you <laughs> now that it's out in the open. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I will talk with you soon and I will see you next week. And yeah, I will just finish the recording now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>